Today I want to share with you a message called Silencing the Foolish. Silencing the Foolish. As we all know, in, <laughs> in our lives there are many people, there are many foolish people, there are many people who say foolish things. And uh, I am one of those people who say a lot of foolish things. And how do we silence those foolish people? How do we silence those foolish talks? You know, whenever I watch television, and, um, and I'm reminded, once again, how anti-Christ or anti-Christian uh, the media is. Maybe especially, I don't want to say media, maybe the Hollywood. You know, oftentimes I watch television, I watch award shows, I watch talk shows, and and I see people and I'm just amazed at how negative they are toward Christianity. And when I hear stuff like this, sometimes I wonder why are they so negative toward God and Jesus Christ? Today I want to share with you before we read the scripture, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. Before I do that, I want to share with you some of the quotes uh, from some of the celebrities uh, that I've found. This is from Jodie Foster. For those of you, she's a really a well-known actress, very good actress. She once said that I absolutely love religions and rituals, even though I don't believe in God. Obviously, she was being sarcastic. No one really loves religion and, and rituals. Billy Joel, actually, he's one of my favorite all-time singers. He, see, he once said, I wasn't raised Catholic, but I used to go to mass with my friends. And I view the whole business as a lot of very enthralling hocus pocus, like a magic, you know, just like a, uh, like a trick. I believe that all important matters have to be settled here on earth, not in the clouds somewhere after we kick off. John Malkovich, another really good actor, he says, I believe in people, I believe in humans, I believe in, in a car, but I don't believe something I have absolutely no evidence for. Bill Meyer, a comedian, now he's a talk show host, one of the most anti-Christian person that I know. All religious people have a neurological disorder, and that religion is insanity by consensus. Worst of all, I actually saw this live on television. Kathy Griffin, she's really a funny comedian. In September of 2007, she won the Emmy Award for Creative Arts. You know, when you watch television for Academy Awards and Emmy Awards and all these different awards, people go up there and they hold the awards. And there are many really wonderful Christians, many believers. First thing they do is they always say, I want to first of all thank God. I want to first of all thank my maker. I want to thank my Lord Jesus Christ. And many people have said that. And Kathy Griffin on this occasion decided to mock those Christians uh, for doing all of those things. And in, in September of 2007, when she won the award, she said this, she says, a lot of people come up here and thank Jesus for this award. I want you to know that no one had less to do with this award than Jesus. And she went on to hold up her Emmy and she made a really a, a off color remark about Jesus Christ. And she said, this award is now my God. When you hear comments like this on television, you ask yourself, what would make, what would prompt someone to say such mean and hateful things about our God? Why, was, why would they say something about our God who 2,000 years ago did nothing but sacrifice his life, die on the cross for our sins? Even on the cross, Jesus uttered the words, Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. And he died and was buried. And three days later, he rose again to save us from death and hell. Why would anyone in their right minds say these hateful and mean things about our Lord Jesus Christ? See, when, when these people say these things, they're not just insulting Christianity, but they're insulting our God. What would make them say such things? I think I know the answer. Oftentimes, people judge God, and I've said this before, not really based upon who God is, but they judge God based upon our own actions. In other words, people really judge God 
And those people who judge God, really, they're ignorant. And I don't, mean, I don't mean that in a negative way. And I mean that really in a literal way. They are ignorant of God. They say these things because they don't really know who God is. They haven't read the Bible. Some say they have, but they haven't really studied God. They haven't meditated on it. They haven't really dwelt on the, the, just the wonderful teachings, and the loving things that God did for us. So oftentimes when people say these things, they say it out of ignorance. And the things that they say are really foolish talks. And to be very honest with you, whenever I hear such words, my immediate reaction is that of anger, to be honest with you. If somebody says something really bad about my wife or children, my immediate reaction is I get angry. Whether it's true or not, I don't like to hear it. And the same thing with God, my God, my Savior. When people mock God like this, my immediate response is there's an anger within me. And my immediate response is I want to debate them. I want to argue with them. I want to really put them down and put that person in that place. But when you study the Bible, actually, the Bible tells us that's not the way we should respond to such ignorance or foolish talks. The Bible, in fact, teaches us there are ways in which we can silence these foolish talks. And that is mentioned, and that is talked about in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. Let's all read this together in one, word, one voice. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. Let's, all be, let's read it together. Let's begin. For the Lord's sake, respect all hum, human authority, whether the king as a head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and honor those who do right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God and respect the king. When you read between the lines of this passage, you actually can understand the reason why people are negative toward Christianity and God. In this, pas in this passage, it says that we need to respect human authority, we need to respect elders, we need to respect God, we need to love everyone. By doing such, the, by such things, it says we can silence the foolish talks. And if you really read between the lines, what is it saying? What they're saying is that the reason why people say these foolish things is, is precisely because we do not do these things as Christians. And because we live our lives in an opposite manner, people say ignorant and foolish things about God. The first thing that's mentioned here by Peter, the disciple of Christ, is that in order to silence the ignorance and the foolish talks, it says is we need to respect all human authority, whether the, all human authority, we need to respect authority. Verse 13, for the Lord's sake, respect all human authority, whether king as head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong, to honor those who do right. It is God's will that you, your honorable life should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. It's specifically here in this passage, Peter says that we need to respect authority. Who are our authorities? That is our president, our government, the lawmakers, the police officers, maybe even our boss who are our authority in our business, in our workplace. Peter says that even those authority, whether you like them or not, whether you agree with every one of their decisions or not, he says we need to do our best to submit to their authority. Of course, our greatest authority is God. But our God is saying, listen to the earthly authority. It's like for me, whenever sometimes, you know, William and Faith, they're only one year apart. But William is one year older than Faith. And sometimes, and we do this in Korea, not long, but sometimes... I leave them for like 30 minutes because I need to go buy something. And I tell, you know, before I leave, I tell Faith and I tell William, Faith, while I'm gone, listen to your oppa, listen to your older brother, William. Okay? He's older than you, so you listen to him. Now, does William make all the right decisions? Absolutely not. Does William, is he really smart enough to take care of Faith? 
No, but there has to be some sort of order. You cannot leave everyone to do whatever they want to do. If you do, then you know what? There's going to be chaos. Everyone's going to fight and argue because they want to do what they want to do. And this is the same way on earth. Whether we like it or not, authority structure, it is God-given. God has given us the authority. And God said you need to respect that authority. And when we live our lives where we do not respect authority, people above us, people in command, then you know what? We're giving God a bad name. And that is one of some of the reasons why people say ignorant things about God and foolish things about us and Christianity. You know, there was a, it's a funny story. There was a man. One time he was speeding on a, on a highway uh, and he got caught by the police. Uh, I don't know how it's done in Korea, but in America, usually police officers, they kind of hide in a corner or behind a tree or a bush and they get out of their car and they hold a radar and they kind of shoot at the cars, you know, and to catch those speeders. And let me just tell you, you know, on this occasion there were many speeders, but this one person got caught. And when he got caught, you know, police officer came to him, you know, checked to see if he was drunk or not. He wasn't. And he wrote out a citation and gave it to this man. And this man, you know, he, was, he wasn't really all too pleased. Not because he got the ticket, but he wasn't all too pleased because he was the only one that got the ticket. Because when the police officer came, he said, you know, I'm sorry, officer. I know that I was speeding and it's my fault. But he said, you know, I wasn't the only one that was speeding, you know. And he says, how come I'm the one getting the ticket? And the police officer looked at him in return and he said, excuse me, but have you ever gone fishing? And the man goes, yes, I have. Have you ever, did you, do you catch all the fish when you go fishing? <laughs> okay, I see about... 40% of the people got that. <laughs> Do you catch all the fish? Do you catch all the wrongdoers? Of course not. You don't. Romans chapter 13 verse 1 states that everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Again, the authorities that God's given us, the laws, the government, God has established that type of structure. And God has given us that authority, given those, established those authorities. And whether we like it or not, we are to submit to them. Now, why is this important? Why is submitting to authority is important? Why is it so important? One reason is, is this. For those of us as, as Christians, as people, if we do not learn how to submit to human, human authorities, guess what? We will have a very difficult time submitting to God. That is just the reality. You know, when I was in the States, when I was working with young people, I always tell young people, you need to obey your parents, whether they're right or wrong. It doesn't matter. You need to submit to them. You need to learn to respect them. And the kids would often, oftentimes reply, yeah, but you know, you don't know how unreasonable my mom is. You don't know how unreasonable my dad is. I said, it doesn't matter. God has placed your parents as your authority. And you must learn to submit to their authority. And then I would look at them and I would look at other students and I would, I would say this. I tell them, this is the fact. If you have trouble respecting and honoring your parents, you, have, you will have trouble respecting and honoring God. Because it works in the same way. We think it's different. We think respecting and honor is about you know, whether they deserve it or not. It's just not true. People that are respectful, if you look at them, they're not just respectful to those who deserve respect. They're respectful to everyone. And I say this to people here. People that are respectful to me, guess what? They're not just respectful to me. They're respectful to others. People that kind of like, ah, oh, you know, I don't care what Pastor Paul say. Guess what? It's not just towards me, but it's also toward others. And it's also towards God. See, that is why it is so important for us to submit to authority. And that is why God has told us that we need to learn to respect and submit to authorities. But again, one, uh, you know, Peter mentions this because this is a, one of the ways in which we can silence the ignorant talks about God and we can silence the foolish talks about Christianity. A second way in which we can silence foolish accusations, he says, is also by 
We can do this by serving others. The verse 16, he says, For you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. In other words, he's saying, we are free. But don't use your freedom to indulge yourselves and live for yourselves. You are free, but you're free to become slaves to God. Submit to God, servant of God. God has called us to live as servants to God and to others. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, it says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. It is an example set before us by Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, he says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. You see, we can silence these ignorant talks when we live as servants of God and serve others. You know, one of the most classic examples, and I've used this person as an example on a couple of occasions in the past, but one of the persons that is so respected and by his workers and by others, his name is... Is a, is a person named Sam Walton. Do, do you know who Sam Walton is? He's the founder of Walmart, Sam's Club. Uh, before he passed away, he was one of the richest men on earth. He would often say that, I despise corporate fat cats. You know, the term fat cat means, you know, it's these lazy people who get rich by, you know, through other people's hard labor. Fat cat. Cats, they don't really do anything. They sit, they eat, and they become fat. Why? Because all they do is eat, eat, eat. And they get big by doing nothing. And he called other executives saying, you know, these people, they're hypocrites. You know, they call themselves, you know, they always tell people, we're in this together. You know, we're all part of one team. And yet he says, you know, they give, you know, he says, how can they say, you know, we're on the same side, same team. We're all in it together. And yet every year they give themselves millions of dollars in bonuses, fly in fancy jets and live in mansions. And how can they say that? You see, Sam Walton, he knew how to work the register because he's done it. He knew how to stock shelves. He knew how to you know, work the stores because he did that even though he was the owner. See, Sam Walton always silenced the ignorant talks and foolish talks through his service. You know, there's a saying that really, really spoke to me and it blessed me. And it goes like this. It says, if you wish to be a leader, you will be frustrated. For every few people wish to be led. But if you aim to be a servant, you will never be frustrated. You know, as a leader, oftentimes it is frustrating because, you know, you want to lead, but you can only lead if people follow. And there's a lot of frustration in that. But if your aim is to serve, guess what? You don't need anyone's permission to serve because that's really up to you. And you can serve as much as you want. And if that's your aim, you will always find success and you will always find happiness. And I thought this was really a wonderful statement. But service is another way in which Peter says that we can silence the ignorant talks and the foolish talks about God and Christianity. And a third way mentioned in this passage that we can silence the ignorance, he says, is by showing respect. It's by showing respect. Verse 17 says, Respect everyone and love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God and respect the king. Respect. You know, there's a funny story about a boss. He was a boss of this, you know, small company. He was getting frustrated by all the lack of respect his workers were giving him. So one morning, he, he went out and he bought a small sign. You know, if you go, I don't know whether they have that in Korea, but in America, you go to a convenience store and they have like a small sign, maybe like this, or sometimes they have it in a miniature license plate and they have different words. And then he bought a small sign. It says, uh, it's, I'm sorry, it says, I'm, I am the boss. I'm the boss. 
little sign. And he put it on his door one morning. And then he taped it to the office. And then later in the day, he returned to his office. And when he came, he, he looked at his door. On the top of the sign, I'm the boss, somebody put another sign, a paper sign. And he read, your wife called. She wants her sign back. Okay. I, <laughs> if you don't get it, you can ask somebody <laughs> later on. <laughs> We're called to respect everyone. And that's how we silence people. But I want to right now take time to mention one specific area that we need to really uh, learn to respect. And that is, we need to learn to respect our elders. We need to learn to respect our elders. Years ago, about 30 years ago, there was a person named Pat Moore. Um, she was an uh, industrial designer, and that means she made costumes and she was really good at like you know making masks and stuff like that and and she was one of those people that kind of knew how to make those masks where you can look like old people you know put on you know what do you, what do you call it those plastic rubber or whatever and stuff like that and then you put it on your head and you put wigs on and stuff and you can transform yourself into making you look you know much older in the span of three years from 1979 to 1982 she decided to just, she just wanted to do it. It wasn't part of a, some sort of research or school project or her job, but she just really wanted to see uh, what it was like to be a senior citizen. So she put on this makeup and she did all these things. So in the span of three years, I'm thinking not every day, but she did this in the span of those times. She would travel and she would do this in different parts in different cities. And, uh, and, and she walked around and as a senior citizen, maybe in her 70s, and this, is, this was her, uh, the impression that she got about being a senior citizen. This is what she concluded. She believed that people that were 70, in their 70s, about 25% of them, she feels, lived their lives abused and neglected. And, and she's not talking about physical abuse. And I'm sure there's some of those. But what she was talking about was this. She said that while she was walking around as a senior citizen, she received a lot of respect from other senior citizens who were older. They would open doors, they would do this, and they would be courteous. But what she also noticed was that there was a lot of um, mistreatment by the younger generation. Simple things, she said, like when she was going to the door, younger people would simply ignore them, walk past them, would not hold the door open, just leave them like this. And when she was carrying things, no one would really help except for other senior citizens who were a little bit younger than she was. And she noticed, she was surprised and amazed by the lack of respect by the younger generation toward older people. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32, it says, Stand up in the presence of the elderly and show respect for the aged. Fear God, I am your God. When he says stand up in the presence of the elderly, that means showing respect. You know, one of the things, and I'm really, to be honest with you, uh, I grew up in the States. But the older I, you know, but my parents were Korean, I grew up in the States. And the older I became, you know, the more familiar I became with Korean culture. And the more familiar I became with Korean culture as a Christian, I really liked the Korean culture. Because I saw so many, so much similarity between the Korean culture and the biblical culture as far as in, 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 in respect to how we treat our elderly and the seniors. You see, in Korean custom, when you're sitting down, when someone uh, older comes in, you stand up out of respect. Because you, you, sh you, know, you should not be in a relaxed, comfortable position when someone that's older than you comes in. You need to stand up out of respect. When you eat, the older people, they eat first. They're served first. When you're sitting down, the older people, elderly, seniors, they get the best seat, the better seat. In America, my, my mom and dad, they always got the front seat. In Korea, when their mom and dad come, they always get the back seat because in Korea, the back seat is the, the, you know, the CEO's seat and so forth. See, Bible tells us we need to respect everyone, but especially our elders 
and seniors. But going back, but not just elders and seniors, but it says we're, to, we're called to respect everyone, love everyone. You know, there's, in America, there's a pastor named Al Harrington, and he was really a highly respected pastor. And the reason why he was so respected was because he always preached and taught to his congregation that we need to respect everyone, treat everyone re with respect, no matter their background. And oftentimes, you know, it's easy to talk. It's easy to say these things. But it's another matter for you to act and live accordingly. But what made this pastor so unique was that he regularly would walk about, drive around, and find homeless people, you know, hungry people, you know, you know, uh, people in you know bad situation, and he would he, he actually invite them over to his house, feed them, and let them sleep on your bed. And to be honest with you, I'm included. How many of us would really do that? But he was so respected was because he didn't just treat people, educated people with respect. He didn't just treat people with money with respect. He didn't just treat his church members with respect. But he, res he showed respect to everyone. And you see, when we live our lives, when we respect others, respect everyone. See, those were the type of actions that silence the ignorant talks, the foolish talks. And lastly, we can silence the ignorant talks when we, when we love everyone. When we love everyone. Verse 17 again says, respect everyone. It says, and love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God and respect the king. Years ago, I heard a testimony of a man who just became a, a Christian recent, recently. He, he, stood, he stood in front of you know, like 200 people and he shared this testimony. He said that even just two, three years ago, up until just two, three years ago, that he hated Christians. Because growing up, he had this negative impression of Christians. He always felt that Christians were judgmental. He always felt that Christians were arrogant. And for some reason, because that impression you know, was implanted in his heart, and he grew up really disliking Christian, Christians altogether. In fact, he kind of grew where he would go out of his way, in fact, to put them down, to criticize them. And he would always tell himself that I will never, ever go to church. But he said one day his wife came home. And his wife came home and asking him to go to church of all places. She mentioned that she met this nice lady in an apartment complex who was a Christian, and that she had invited her to church. And the reason why that she, you know, was inviting him to go to church with her was that she just couldn't say no to this nice Christian lady, for she had been for months been helping her. You see, they were a young couple from Korea. They didn't speak English, much English. While the husband worked, she was at home with her young baby. She was lonely. She didn't really know, she didn't have much friends. And because she didn't speak the language, English language, she didn't know what to do. She didn't really know how to take care of herself. Until one day she met this nice Christian lady who took time to actually spend time with her, talk with her. Oftentimes she would invite her for lunch and she would cook for her almost every day. And, then, and sometimes when she was busy and when she had to run an errand, she would actually babysit, take care of the baby for her. Not to mention help her out with some of the other things, going shopping, buying stuff. And she said when she invited her to church, she said she couldn't say no. And she said, I, you know, I, I, had, I should go. She's so nice to me. I should go. When the husband heard that, even though he hated Christianity, and even though he committed to himself, I will never go, I will never ever go, and he was still holding on to that conviction, but he understood where his wife was coming from. And he said, okay, I'm not going to go. But... You can go. So the wife began to go to church along with this Christian lady. Weeks went by, months went by. And the wife, she fell in love with church and she fell in love with Jesus Christ. And now it wasn't just because of this Christian lady's urging. Now she wanted her husband to go. She kept saying, honey, 
let's go to church, let's go to church. She would try for weeks and weeks and months. But husband, he would say, if you keep talking like that, I'm going to stop, make, I'm going to stop you from going to church as well. But weeks would pass and months would pass. But their relationship, you know, grew. Their family and the Christian family. Now, you know, they would invite them, the whole family out for dinner sometime. They would come. And over the weeks and months, he would continue to witness this nice Christian family, helping them, helping his wife and his child. And in the end, even he couldn't deny and reject this love that this Christian family showed. And finally, after months and months, he said, okay, I'll go to church with you. And he went. And once he went, he realized that church was not what he expected. It wasn't filled with all these arrogant hypocrites. I'm sure they were. He just didn't get to really get to know a lot of them <laughs> too well. But on the surface, he noticed that these were very kind people. But they were not judgmental. They were not as arrogant as he thought they would be. In fact, they were kind, courteous. Even though he didn't meet a lot of them, he got to know a few other people. And they were kind and generous toward him and his wife. So he decided, okay, I'm going to continue to go. Weeks turned into months. And after a few months, during one of the service, worship service, God opened his heart. And he realized, and he saw the true God. And he decided, he said, I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. And he gave his life and became a Christian. You see, we can silence the ignorant talks about God. We can silence the foolish accusations about Christianity. Not because we can argue with them. Believe me, I can argue with the best. But you know what? I've never won over someone because I won an argument. The Bible teaches us the best way for us to silence the ignorant talks, the foolish accusations, is by loving people, by respecting them, by serving them. John chapter 13, verse 34, 35, he says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciple. Again, when we love, we silence the ignorant and the foolish. See, people can be very critical about God, and many are. But I've said this on many occasions, that the people do not... People judge the amazing God by reading not the Bible, but by reading us. You see, people out there, they do not read the Bible. And they don't know what you and I know about God. They read us and our lives and our actions. And that is why God has commanded all of us that we need to silence this ignorance and the foolish talks. Not by force or not by clever arguments, but by respecting them, by serving them, and by loving them. That is how we silence the foolish accusations against our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray.